Okay, so welcome to video three. We're continuing additional facts on classical conditioning. This is the second part. Um, information on here can be found from page 222 to page 227 in your textbook. First thing, person I want to talk about is John Watson. After Pavlov did research um, on digestion with dogs and he came up with the idea of classical conditioning, John Watson expanded his ideas. Um, he is known as the APA president. He became APA president in 1915. He also um, titled the idea that we've been talking about, where you learn through experiences, um, as the behaviorist manifesto. And this is where behaviorism came about, the idea, the title, behaviorism. Psychology's content should be um, considered um, based off of the behavior one does. It's a method... Psychology should be studied um, by objective data rather than introspection. So you, he was one that really didn't agree with Freud, where all your unconscious nature really creates you who you are. He believed that it's an experience. You have to learn from that experience. He wanted to look at prediction and controlling behavior. And he really believed to ignore a reference to inner thoughts, feelings, and motives. Today, most psychologists state one should not ignore the mental states. Um, however, that both of these kind of work together. But he officially titled the idea as behaviorism. So what was Watson experiment? Um, Watson experiment is known as the Little Albert experiment. The Little Albert experiment was a famous psychology experiment conducted by behaviorist John Watson and his graduate student, Rosalie Rayner. Watson was interested in taking Pavlov's research further to show that emotional reactions could be um, classically conditioned. So fear can be classically conditioned. The participant in the experiment was a child that was called Albert B. Today we know him as Little Albert. It, he was around the age of nine months. Watson and Raynard exposed the child to a series of stimuli, including a white rat, a rabbit, a monkey, masks, burning newspapers, and observed his uh, reactions. There were no reactions. Okay, At this point in time, when you're nine months old, if I showed you a white fuzzy rat, you probably wouldn't respond in any way. Okay, The boy initially showed no fear of any of the objects. However, the next um, time Albert was exposed to the rat, Watson made a loud noise by hitting a metal pipe with a hammer. If you hit and banged a metal pipe in my ear right now, I probably would jump. Okay, so that was causing a natural reaction. Naturally, the child began to cry after hearing the loud noise. After repeatedly pairing the white rat with the loud noise, Albert began to cry simply after seeing the rat. And this is where conditioning took place. Okay, just showing Albert the rat now, he was going to be fearful because he thought there was going to be a loud bang. Okay, so let's try this and apply it. Okay, so you have your UCS, UCR, CLCR. You set up the formula. Okay, always start with setting up the formula. Unconditioned stimulus, unconditioned response. Things that naturally make you react. Then you have conditioned, learned, stimulus, and conditioned response, learned response. Okay, I always look at what the reaction was. Okay, so little Albert okay, started to cry or have fear. Okay, so the reaction naturally okay, would be fear. He was going to cry. What first made him cry? Was it the rat or was it the banging? Okay, if I were to show you a rat when you're nine months old and you've never been conditioned by anything, you might smile, laugh, giggle. If I were to bang in your ear, Okay, that would make you naturally respond. So it was the loud bang. Okay, so the UCS here would be the loud bang. The UCR would be the fear. Now, how is what is he learning? What is he learning to do? Look at the reaction. How does he respond again? Okay, well, once again, he cries and has fears. But now, what makes him cry and have fear? Well, it's the rat. If it's anything that's white. Right? That's what they were proving. Okay, so here's what the Little Albert experiment looks like. Again, make sure you have this formula in your notes. OK, 
Okay. You have the neutral stimulus, which was the rat, which eventually becomes the conditioned stimulus. You pair it with the unconditioned, um, unconditioned stimulus. You get an unconditioned response. You pair it enough times, okay, and then all of a sudden the conditioned stimulus is going to cause a conditioned response, the rat. It only took seven trials for little Albert to respond to the rat. Watson and Raynard would strengthen the response every five or so by reintroducing the unconditioned stimulus. Okay. In addition to demonstrating that emotional responses could be conditioned in humans, they observed that the stimulus generalization had occurred. So this is that generalization we talked about before. Okay. After conditioning, Albert feared not only just white rats, Okay, he was fearing a wide variety of other white objects. This is where they found that things can be generalized. This fear included other furry objects such as white rabbits, white beards, and white masks. Okay, if you showed Albert at the age of nine months anything that was white, he would respond. Okay, so many early researchers thought that um, behaviorism was the only indication that can influence behavior. Um, but there are now current researchers that believe that cognition and um, the biological influences could also influence learned behavior. So this is extending Pavlov's research on the cognitive process and how that influences us along with the behavioralist process in learning. Early psychologists believed that there were no cognitive connections. Martin Selman's discovery of learned helplessness helped prove that cognition does um, influence learning. Learned helplessness is the help hopelessness and passive resignation an animal or human learns when unable to report ad uh, adverse events. So they did an experiment where they found when they strapped a dog in a harness and given repeated shocks with no opportunity to avoid them, they learned to basically be helpless. Okay. Later, when placed in another situation where one could escape, Okay, they, they unstrapped the harness, but there was a little board they had to leap over. Okay, so they could escape the punishment. The dog cowered as if there was no hope to, es to escape at all. So they learned to just kind of give up. In contrast, animals able to escape the first shock learned personal control and that they can escape any situation. Okay, remember that this is a part of cognition because they had to remember when they were able to escape. Okay, they were learning these behaviors. This happens especially in school systems. Okay, the kid is told over and over and over, you're a failure. Eventually, they always kind of are going to start thinking, well, I'm a failure. I could never do it. They learn to just be hopeless, that they'll never have a sense of winning. Along with cognitive influences, there's also biological influences that can influence behavior. Researcher John Garcia believes firmly that animals and humans can both be classically conditioned. And he tried to prove this study, or he found this study, when um, looking at rats. He noticed that rats began to avoid drinking from bottles that had been placed in radiation chambers. Did rats, might rats have linked the plastic tasting water, the conditioned stimulus, the plastic bottles, to the sickness, the unconditioned response triggered by radiation? So radiation was causing the rats to get sick. That's the unconditioned response. But now they were able to just notice that certain plastic bottles, so that was the conditioned stimulus, was making them sick. So Garcia tested this idea. Okay, He gave rats a particular taste, followed by the radiation drug, and he saw the rats found that they got sick. So when rats were exposed to that taste or that... Um, any type of similar food, the rats would simply just avoid the food. The sick and rats develop aversions for the taste. Not just the sight or the sound, but now they were beginning to avoid taste. They simply avoided the taste. This is known as taste aversion. Okay. Think about a time when you got the flu and you were given a food. Now your body gets sick when just eating the food. So when I was little, the flu would make me get sick. Okay. But my mom paired the flu with chicken noodle soup. So now every time I think about chicken noodle soup, I think about getting sick. Okay, That's known as taste aversion. Another study that was done um, where we bi our biological influences influence conditioning um, was with colors. Andrew Elliott and Danielle Nista 
found that men are more prone to be attracted to red colors. Men repeatedly um, were more attractive and sexually desirable when surveyed these two pictures. Okay, the woman in that was had the black border and the woman in the red border. They surveyed hundreds and hundreds of men, and they showed repeated pictures: men, um, women with the borders of red and women with the borders of black. And what they found over and over again, even this is even though this is the same woman, they retested the same men, and they found the men would choose the women with the red borders over and over and over again. For animals and for humans, red biologically signals in our body that we're, um, for women, we're beginning ovulation. We're beginning to increase our blood flow. And that for some animals and for humans long ago, that was a survival trait. So they believe that we've passed down this gene in men, and men maybe don't, aren't even aware of it, but red signals for men that women are able to ovulate and then they could reproduce and that's why men should be more prone to um, instinctually choose the red traits. So Garcia, Elliot, and Nista ideas all support natural selection where conditioning um, helps aid survival. Not only are we learning specific traits but we're also biologically predisposed to select certain traits as well. So the biopsychosocial um, model does also influence um, learning. Okay, the social, obviously, that's where the behavioral falls under. Um, Watson, Pavlov, Aristotle, John Locke all believe we learn through experiences. However, we also have to learn through memory. Um, associations, memory, discrimination, generalization, predictability, that all has to do with the psychological area. And then the biological influence in terms of learning, well, we have biological reflexes, um, the natural reflexes that get trained, and we also have food traits our body inherits, um, and then our um, traits that we inherit, specific colors, and so forth. So all of these work together to really influence learning. Pavlov's legacy. Um, Pavlov is still supported today um, in terms of these ideas. All our organisms learn to adapt from their environment. They learn from their environment. Pavlov shows us how we can study learning objectively. Okay, we can study how many times and we could actually set up experiments in terms of how kids can actually learn things. Um, and we still use classical conditioning today and you're probably going to see them in several units. Um, we learn that we use classical conditioning in schools. We use classical conditioning in advertising. Okay, they pair many um, attractive women with cars, meaning that you're going to be, if you buy that car, you're going to get an attractive woman. That's all classical conditioning. And they use classical conditioning um, in therapy techniques today.